So we're continuing on with the 11th chapter of Hari Bhakti Vilas. So last time we finished off with uh, text 513 of the 11th chapter of Hari Bhakti Vilas. Now we're finishing, now we're starting off with uh, text 514. We discussed so many wonderful things about the holy name so far. Now uh, we're going to describe. Um, we're going to describe that if a person thinks that the holy name, the glories of the holy name are exaggeration, the fate of that person. So we're going to describe some negative things about not having faith in the holy name. So uh, the fate of a person who thinks that the glories of the holy name are exaggeration. So from Katyayana Samhita, again, Katyayana Samhita sounds like a, sounds like a Vedic text, but here it may be some other, maybe a Pancharatra Agama or something like that. It, it, I've never really seen this Katyayana Samhita. So, a sinful person who considers the glories of the holy names of Lord Hari to be imagination will certainly tra traverse the path to hell. Text 515. The Supreme Lord spoke this verse to Bodhayana. Bodhayana is a very famous Rishi who, is, uh, who has written a uh, commentary on. Um, or has, has re actually written a Griha Sutra um, uh, yeah, for Taitiya Krishna Jivedans, right? Uh, and, and as recorded in the Brahma Samhita, the Brahma Samhita, this Brahma Samhita is not the same Brahma Samhita that, that Gaudiya Vaishnavas usually think of, which was found by Lord Chaitanya in South India, but this is another Brahma Samhita. So it says, uh, unto those who do not believe in the results of chanting the holy names of the Lord that are described in the revealed scriptures, but rather consider them to be an exaggeration, I personally inflict upon them various sufferings and throw them into the ocean of miseries in this material world. So this is the Supreme Lord saying this. Text 516 to 517 from the Jaimini Samhita. So we have all these Samhita is by these different rishis, Katyayana Samhita. Now we have Jaimini. Jaimini also was a sage of the, uh, uh, I believe, of the, of the Yajurveda. Uh, so it's interesting how it starts out. Shruti, Shmiti, Purani, Shu. So in the Shruti, Shmitis, and Puranas. So those who consider the statements of the Shruti, Shmitis, and Puranas uh, that praise the glories of the Holy Name to be imagination will suffer unlimitedly in hell. Therefore, uh, every intelligent person must be careful about committing offenses against the chanting of the holy names, which are the only benefactor of all conditioned souls and, and the only object worthy of service for all classes of men. Text 518 to 520. Sanat Kumara spoke these verses to uh, Narada Muni, uh, which are found in the Padma Purana. If a most simple person takes shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Hari, then he can become freed from all his sinful reactions. If a person who is the lowest amongst mankind and had committed offenses at the lotus feet of Lord Hari takes shelter of the Lord's holy names, he can become freed from all from these offenses. Therefore, there is no doubt that if a person commits offenses at the, at the lotus feet of the holy name, therefore, where is the doubt that if a person commits offenses at the lotus feet of the holy name, he will certainly be degraded to a hellish condition of life. So it's interesting, the juxtaposition here is saying that if uh, a person is simply sinful, he can take, he can take, he can surrender to the Supreme Lord. Sri Manarayana Krishna Hari, Lord Hari. If the person is the lowest of mankind and commits offenses at the, at the feet of the Lord, right? He can take shelter of the holy name, and the holy name seems here to be explained to be like more uh, merciful than the Lord Himself. Therefore, right then, the last the last section says, "What what happens if you commit an offense to the holy name?" It's, it's the idea is that in the sloka, it's worse than committing offense to the Lord Himself, or worse than committing a, uh, an ordinary sin. 
So here we're talking about three different types of sins. We're talking about offenses or sins in general, offenses directly to the, lo to the lotus feet of the Lord, and then offenses to the holy name. And it's, it's basically saying that those are the worst. Because even if we, even if we, have, if we sin, we can simply surrender to the Lord. If we sin against the Lord, right, then we can take shelter of the holy name. But if we sin against the holy name, where's the shelter? There's no shelter. It's very interesting. That's a very, very, very interesting uh, statement from Padma Purana by Sanat Kumar. Okay. So now we get uh, now we get the traditional listing of the whole of the offenses of the holy name. So this is coming. Uh, Sanat Kumar is, is is telling these verses to Narada Muni. Ata nama paradaha. Right. So these are the these are when we see ata, it's it means thus. It means the, the beginning of a section where it, where it says it's going to say something. It's a specific thing. So here the they're going to be listed. Satamminda. Namna paramam aparadam itanate yata kyatim yata katam u sahate tadvigraham shivasya shi vishnu yahiha guna namadi sakalam diya dinam hasyet sa kalo kalu hari namat ahita karaha guru avagya shuti shastra nindanam. So Tatatavado Hari nam ni kalpanam nam no balad yasya hi papa buddhir navidite tasya yamea hi sudihi dharma vatatiago hutari sarvas shuba kriya samam api pamadaha ashradadhani vimuke vimuke kepi ashrinbati Yash cho padesha shiva shiva nama paradaha. Shute pi nama mahatne ya pri priti rahito naraha. Ham mamadi padamo namni so pi aparada krit. Okay, so I know that a lot of times people will, will, will at least say the English of these every day. There's the Sanskrit for you. And, it, and uh, it's, it hasn't mentioned where it's from, but I think uh, we can look it up. And I, uh, I think that the, it's from some Purana and we can, we can look it up. So, okay, so let's get into it. So the translation is, number one, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives for propagating the holy names, names of the Lord. Two, to consider the names of demigods or devatas to be equal to or independent to the holy name of Lord Vishnu. Three, to disobey the orders of the spiritual master. Four, to blaspheme the Vedic literatures or literatures in pursuance of the Vedic version. Five, to consider the glories of the holy name to be imagination. That's what we've just been talking about. Two, six, to give some interpretation on the holy name of the Lord. This means some wrong interpretation. Um, of course, we can understand different realizations of there of the acharyas and the scriptures about different names of the Lord and what they mean and their, you know, when they should be chanted and all this sort of thing. But that's not imagination. That's according to the scriptures and according to the acharyas. So uh, number seven, to commit sinful activities on the strength of the holy name of the Lord. Number eight, to consider pious activities to be equal to the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. So other pious activities like opening hospitals, digging wells, helping the poor, feeding the poor, like that. To number nine, to instruct faithless persons about the glories of the holy name of the Lord. Even in the Bhagavad Gita at the end, Lord Krishna says that this secret knowledge should not be spoken to those people who are not austere, who are not devoted, etc. So in English, we have the saying, casting pearls before swine, right? So if you have a bunch of pigs or hogs, you don't, you don't give them pearls because they don't know what to do with them. They, don't, they can't appreciate diamonds or pearls or jewels like that. So, you, so we say in English, to cast pearls before swine. It's a waste of time telling people. And in fact, it's considered to be an offense. Here it's considered to be an offense to instruct people about the glories of the Holy Name if they can't understand it. They can't, they can't, I mean, we can say that basically the same thing for any philosophical point or any point of uh, spirituality. 
when a person is ready for it, when a person can be easily, when it can be easily explained to them, yes, you can do that and you can, you can uplift people. But you can't preach to the faithless people who are totally faithless, who are inimical to, to the Supreme Lord and to, to uh, Vaishnavism um, because they just become offensive. So, to, and they don't understand. They won't understand. To, now, now, some people, some Vaishnavas are so magnanimous, they're so compassionate that they even preach to the people who are uh, the lowest of the low and who are, who are faithless persons like that. We have a good example in, in uh, Lord Chaitanya's Leela, in Lord Chaitanya's life, of, the, of Lord Ichinanda preaching to the drunkard womanizers, Jagai and Madai. So there were these two people who were drunken womanizers and, and they, he preached to them. They became belligerent and they attacked him and Lord Chaitanya came and he was going to invoke his Sudarshana chakra and kill them. Um, but Lord Nityananda prayed for their deliverance and said, if you, my Lord, if you're going to kill people like this, you're going to, you have to kill everybody in Kali Yuga because everybody pretty much is a drunken womanizer. Everybody's a demon in Kali Yuga. Everyone's an Asura. Everyone's a sinful person. So if you're going to kill, if you're going to uh, act like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, uh, if you're going to destroy the miscreants by killing them, then uh, in this incarnation of Lord Chaitanya, then you're not going to, you have to kill everybody in Kali Yuga because it's such a sinful age. So instead, uh, the idea is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spread his preaching to, of, of love of Godhead and the holy names to kill the demonic mentality of the people in Kali Yuga. So it's, it's, everybody's simple in Kali Yuga, we're all sinners. And uh, therefore, uh, the idea is that by preaching, if we can somehow change the person's mentality, right, then we've killed their demonic mentality, the demon, right? So it's said actually, um, I don't know where exactly, but in the scriptures, it's said somewhere that in the first Yuga, in the Kriti Yuga or Satya Yuga, the demons were in different planets and the, from, the, from the, the godly people and the ungodly people were two different places like that. In, in the next yuga, in the Treta yuga, they were in different um, countries, right? So, you know, we, during the time of Lord Rama, let's say we had, you know, devotees in India and we, in Sri Lanka, we had Ravana, we had the, the demoniac asuras. And then in the third yuga, in the Dwarpa yuga, the time of Lord Krishna, we had in different bodies. So you had one person, one, one person was divine and, or godly, and the other person was a demon. Like that. But in Kali Yuga, it, in Kali Yuga, it seems even within the same body, we have these two forces of divine and demoniac, even with their own body, like that. Sometimes you'll see. Um, in, if anybody ever sees this, uh, a cartoon, they have these cartoons where. Uh, the person is thinking something, and a and a and a small a small devil and a small angel will, will appear on his shoulder and they'll argue, and this is considered to be the two parts of the person's consciousness. He has a divine aspect and he has a he has a demoniac aspect, like that. So in in Vaishnavism and Hinduism in general, we don't believe in a devil. There's no there's no personality which is an anti god. Right, so in the Semitic religions like Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, they have this idea of, a, of an anti-god, a devil who is an anti-god. So he, that doesn't make sense from a philosophical point of view. And, and in the Eastern religions of, uh, you know, that all come from the Vedic, you know, sources and things like that, they don't under, they don't understand that there can be any any uh, opposite to God or any anything which can challenge God. Right? In, in, in Semitic religions, the devil's always challenging God, and there's this play of good and evil. The real play of good and evil is within ourselves, is within ourselves. So whether, whether our good nature, our spiritual nature will shine forth, or whether the bad nature will shine forth like that. So because of ignorance, we have this interplay within ourselves, uh, because of illusion and ignorance in this material world, we have this interplay between goodness and, and ignorance and in our in our own bodies, um, in our own minds, but um, this is this doesn't occur between God and some devil like that. That's here within ourselves. So this is our consciousness that so we have. You know, we have one part of our consciousness telling us to sin, and one part of our consciousness telling us to be good, like that. So here, 
the idea is that they're a faithless person. So the person himself is really not faithless. The person himself we know is the spirit soul, right? The spirit soul is pure, it's pristine, is, is clear like a crystal, is, is, is uh, untouched, but it becomes covered by ignorance, just like a gem is covered by mud in this, in, in this world. If you drop a diamond in the mud, you can't see it. It looks like mud because it's covered with mud, but you have to wash it off. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Shikshastika has explained that in this Kali Yuga, the Yuga Dharma is chanting the holy name. And by chanting the holy name, you can cleanse the mirror of the heart, right? In the Bhagavad Gita, the soul is compared, the soul within a material body covered by ignorance or illusion is compared to three things. It's compared to the, to, to the embryo in the womb, covered by the womb, the mother's womb, the, 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 the child in the, in the mother's womb cannot see the outside. So it's completely in darkness because it's covered by the womb. Uh, a mirror which is covered by dust, mirror which is covered by dust, if you go in, into an attic where there's a mirror and you look in the mirror, it's completely covered by dust. You can't see your reflection or whatever you see is distorted. So we see a distorted form of ourselves. We think that, that we're this body. Or the third analogy given in the Bhagavad Gita is like a, like a fire covered by smoke. So sometimes we light a fire, but there's so much smoke that we can't see the flames of the fire. We don't realize that there's actually a fire there like that. So we can't take advantage of the heat or the light of the fire because there's so much smoke. The important aspects that come from a fire, heat and light. Similarly, the important aspects from the scripture, we get light, we get realization, we get, we get um, spiritual knowledge from the scriptures, but we can't take advantage of it if, if it's covered by the smoke of illusion, but in the, in the form of commentaries or, or instructions by people who don't understand the scriptures properly or who have, mis who have misunderstood them like that. So this is the idea. The idea is not that the person himself is faithless, but the, per the person is pure, but the person is covered by illusion, different types of illusion. And again, in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, all knowledge comes from me. So from the Lord, all knowledge comes, all knowledge, all remembrance. So anything that, if you can remember something, that's only because God allows you to remember it. If you, if you have knowledge, any form of knowledge, it's only because God allows you to, because he's covering everything in this material world with his illusion, illusory energy, right? Ignorance. <clears throat> and if, if you have forgetfulness, he can also make you forget. So when we talk about a faithless person, it's a person who's in so much ignorance or so much delusion that he's covered with ignorance and he is, he has been made by God to forget, to forget his real nature, that he is the soul and he is an eternal servant of God like that. That is a faithless, that is a faithless person. Now, it's possible, but it's only possible by the, by the grace of God, actually, because all knowledge come, remembrance comes from God. So it's possible to, to reawaken that, that, uh, that, it's possible to reawaken that faith and to reawaken that knowledge and to reawaken that, that uh, remembrance of, of God. But um, it's only possible by the grace of God. And so we have to be careful when we're preaching, when we're teaching people, when we're trying to teach people spiritual things, because they have to realize those things like that. So many times you try to impress upon a person a spiritual concept like that. They're unable to accept it. They're unable to understand it like that. Just, just as an analogy would be like a starving person is unable to, uh, is unable to hear philosophy because he's starving. He's, he, his, his immediate need is for getting out of, um, that starving condition for getting something to eat. After you give him something to eat, then he may sit down and he may listen to something spiritual like that. So this is also described in the seventh, seventh uh, chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says there are four types of people who approach me, four types of people who don't approach me. So one of the, uh, one of the persons is that person who is in distress. So when the person is in distress, he prays to God for relief from the distress, but he doesn't pray to God necessarily for liberation or for spiritual knowledge. He just simply wants to get rid of the, the what, what's afflicting him right now, right here and now. So I have a problem right here and now. I'm being attacked by some, some I have some obstacle I'm being attacked by. I'm, I'm experiencing some 
problem in this material world. So I pray to God to get rid of that problem here and now. So faithless person, we shouldn't preach to the faithless person. Of course, if we can change the mind of a faithless person to become a faithful person, then we can preach the glories of the holy name to them and other things as well. So it's a very interesting, um, uh, I just wanted to highlight that. Number 10, to maintain material attachment. Very difficult in this material world. We are in this body, in this mind, in this subtle, gross and subtle body. Even after receiving so many instructions in this regard, considering the material body to be me and everything in relation to the body as mine. So very, 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 very interesting. Very good um, rules here. And so these are, the, these are in, in essence, the apparatus or the offenses against the holy name. I think we mentioned before, there are three stages of chanting. There's the offensive stage. So in the offensive stage, which is called Nama Aparada, Aparada means, the, means uh, offense. Nama means the holy name. So in the Nama Aparada stage, one may be chanting the holy name, but, have, but may be committing all of these offenses. In the next stage, which is either called the clearing stage or the Nama Vasa stage, right? It's a shadow of the pure name. It's, a, it's, it's like the pure name. It's not offensive, but it's also not, it's sort of neutral. Um, in that, in that uh, and the example is the, the story of Ajamil at the time of death he spoke, he said the name Narayana, which was the name of his son, but also the name of the Supreme Lord. So he, he wasn't saying it in an offensive way. There was no offense committed by him, but also he wasn't saying it in a totally pure way, understanding that it was the name of the Lord and really um, understanding that it was a holy name, etc. Et so... Um, so that's the middle stage. And then, the, then there's a stage beyond that, which is called pure uh, shudanam or pure, the pure name, purely chanting the name. And that is the best. Of course, that's the best and the most efficacious. So, okay. So the, anyway, that's, I just thought I would take a little time because this is a very important section and uh, people are very, um, should take into consideration this, these offenses when they're chanting the whole name. So that, that means when you're chanting at any time, in your mind, in japa, in kirtana, any time, any type of chanting, we should take all of these uh, offenses uh, into consideration. On the other hand, we also have to say that in the scriptures, many times it said that there is no rules and regulations for chanting the holy name. Specifically, we can look back at the Kalishantra and the Upanishad and the Hari Rama Mahamantra in the, in the Kalishantra and the Upanishad. It says there is no there are no rules and regulations for doing that like that. So one may ask, okay, here are all these offenses listed. So isn't, doesn't that mean that there's rules? These are rules. These are rules to follow. You should do this. You shouldn't do that like that. These are rules. Even if you don't follow these rules, you will get supreme benefit by chanting the holy name of the Lord. That's the point. That's the point. You will get more benefit, of course, if you do follow these rules, if you chant offensive, offenselessly. But ultimately, even, the, even people like Shishupala who cursed out Lord Krishna a hundred times, he attained liberation. So even inimically chanting the holy name of the Lord with many offenses, one eventually achieves the, the, the supreme goal by, of attaining the, the Lord's service in Sri Lanka, like that. So, so hopefully if one keeps on chanting, one goes from the offensive stage to the clearing stage, the neutral stage to the your estate. So that's that's the point. Okay, so continuing on with 525, text 525, if due to carelessness or any other reason one commits an offense at the lotus feet of the holy name, one must take complete shelter of the holy name and continue chanting without cessation. Okay, so this is nice. And it doesn't say that this is coming from any scripture. This seems to be one of the Goswami's own verses that he's written here, Prabhupada Goswami, because Hari Bhakti Vilas is full of quotations, but it also has, you know, these, uh, these, these uh, verses that are given directly by the author of, of Hari Bhakti Vilas. So either Prabhupada Goswami or Sanat Goswami has written this, um, this verse. In my opinion, it, you know, it doesn't say that it's a quotation from somewhere else. So it says, so, you know, what to do if we commit these offenses to, to in order to cl in clarify he says, just keep chanting, continue to chant without cessation, and that, that eventually, sada sankirtana, sankirtana nama, 
right? So, sada means always, always chant, right? And this is also an echo of what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says in his Shikshasakam. He says, Nam Nama Akari Bahuda, Nidza Sarva Shaktis. Well, my Lord, you have millions of names. You have many, many millions of names, unlimited names. And you invest all your potencies in these names, right? And they're all invested with all your potencies, right? And he says, Kirtaniya Sada Hari. You should always chant these names. Kirtaniya Sada Hari, right? Actually, that comes in another verse where he says that if you, that, that um, one should think oneself lower than the straw in the street, devoid of all false ego, and ready to offer all respects to others. In such a state of mind, one can chant always like that. So the instruction here by the Goswami is to chant always, to always chant the holy name. And that is echo, that's an echo from what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Kirtaniya Sadahari in the Shikshastaka. And he says how to do that by becoming by being humble, so giving up false ego. So if we give up a false ego or false um, identification with the body, then all of these things will naturally follow. We will follow. We'll, we'll, we won't commit the offenses, and we'll we'll come to the clearing and to the pure state. Okay. So continuing on, what if we commit some offense, right? So how to counteract offenses in chanting of the holy name, right? To counteract an offense, so. Text 526, Sanat Kumar speaking again, continued speaking to Narada Muni. So we're not sure here. Uh, it may be that 525 is also part of this. We have to, we should look it up and look it up and see if, uh, in the actual Purana where it's mentioned and see if the text uh, 525 is, is part of the Purana or whether it's, uh, so I'm, I'm, suge I'm suggesting that it might be a separate verse by the Goswami because here, in 526, he's written to counteract an offense, and he's written uh, continuing to speak. No, Sana Kumar is continuing to speak to Narada Muni. He wouldn't need to say that he's continuing to speak. He would just need to continue. Unless he thinks, okay, it's a different topic, and therefore I'm going to give a headline of a topic, a certain topic here. And we don't know also whether these, the, the section, these section, um, these section headings are given actually by the Goswamis or whether they're put in later by somebody else. We don't know. So <clears throat> the holy names uh, alone can destroy the offenses one commits at the lotus of the holy name. So that makes sense, right? So that with the, with the instruction from before to continue chanting, right? The idea is if you committed an offense in chanting, continue to chant. So if one continues to chant the holy names of the Lord by the mercy of the holy names, he may become freed from all offenses and ultimately achieve one uh, life's ultimate goal. Text 570 to 527. Excuse me. So now it says, it, it is a fact that if a person chants even one holy name of Lord Hari, or hears one holy name, whether he utters the holy names correctly or incorrectly, the holy name will nevertheless deliver him. Still, he may not have uh, immediately obtain the principal fruit of chanting the holy names of Lord. If the holy name is chanted by atheists who are simply interested in the gratification of their bodies, wealth, and family members, it will eventually bear fruit, but not immediately. So this is the difference. All right? So if you want immediately the, 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 um, the fruit of chanting the holy name, the spiritual fruit, then you have to... Um, take care of these uh, uh, offenses and all these other things. But if you simply chant the holy name of Lord in whatever condition or, or in whatever way, right? Eventually, eventually you will achieve the fruit. So text uh, 528. Therefore, this statement was made by Narada Muni as found in the Brihad Narada Purana. So he says, how can a less intelligent person like me chant the holy names of the Lord? Now this is Narada Muni, this is Narada Rishi, who's a great, Devotee of the Lord, a great saint, a great spiritual master, a great guru, I like that, a great seer. And he is saying this, right? So he's saying, he's saying, how can a less intelligent person like me chant the holy names of the Lord, whose glories cannot be estimated even by exalted personalities such as Manu and the foremost, uh, other foremost sages? So he's asking this. It's a rhetorical question because obviously he's, he's eminently qualified to chant the holy name of the Lord. 
text uh, 529. In this way, learned devotees execute. So this is just showing the humbleness of, of Narada, right? His humility, right? But he's thinking that he's unqualified to chant the holy names of the Lord. And so this is an example for all of us that you know, just as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said in Shikshasana, if you're humble and chant the holy names of the Lord, that's the best position. You can then chant the holy name incessantly or um, always, sada. So, text uh, 529. In this way, learned devotees execute devotional service to, at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. It is not easy to obtain the stage of pure devotional service. Only by a piety that one had accumulated since many births and by the mercy of Krishna, pure devotional service is awakened within the heart. Okay, so the first statement is very, is, is we have to take notice of this. The first statement is it's very difficult. The uh, uh, learned devotees execute devotional service at the, at the feet of the Lord. It's not easy to obtain pure devotional service. So service to the Lord, once we're, if we perform service to the Lord, that's possible. To perform pure devotional service, however, is very difficult. So now, what is the cause of pure devotional service? Piety or pious acts that we have done in previous births, right? Because they're in previous births, we may not know that we've done pious activities. That is called in Sanskrit, agyata. Agyata means unknown. And sukriti means punya or pious activities. So agyata sukriti means in previous births, we may have done something. Even in this birth, we may do something we don't know. We don't know that we've done it. And apparently it's a pious activity to do it. Some, just like a person uh, who's starving in a, in, a, in a famine or something like that, and he, he, he has nothing to eat on a courtesy. So he has nothing to eat on a courtesy, so he fasts until, and he gets some food the next day, like that. Unknowingly, he has fasted on a courtesy. Unknowingly. He didn't even know it was a courtesy. Maybe he wasn't even a Vaishnava, like that. But he's un, unknowingly fasted on a courtesy. This is an example of unknown, some unknown pious activity, some unknown activity. Okay, so then, so as a, as a result of that accumulating unknown pious activities or uh, unperceived pious activities, uh, and also, secondly, not to forget the most important thing, pure mer the mercy of, of the Lord, the mercy of Lord Krishna, the grace of the Lord, right? So by uh, un unknown devotional activities and and uh, or unknown piety, right? And by the mercy of the Lord, pure devotion will ultimately be awakened in the heart of all living beings. Nice. Text 530, devotional service is very rarely achieved. So it seems like now we're transitioning away from specifically the point about chanting the holy names of the Lord and going more into a discussion or uh, glorification of the devotional service of the Lord. Of course, the chanting of the holy names is also a service, right? But at the same time, um, uh, Prabhupada used to say that the, 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 that the Hare Krishna mantra, uh, that he used to say oh my, it, it, that it basically is a cry for, to the Lord to engage oneself in, in, his, in his service. Oh, my Lord, oh, the energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service, is the way that Prabhupada used to translate the mantra. So uh, the Maha Mantra. So, so, um, so the idea is that by chanting the mantra, we are praying to the Lord to engage in service. But, but the fact is that even just chanting the mantra is also a type of service to the Lord. Right. So here we're talking about devotional service is very rarely achieved. In the Skanda Purana, Parashara, meaning Parashara Rishi, right, has spoken, the father of Veda Vyasa, has spoken the following sloka. People whose hearts are full of deceit, who are foolish, who are and who are miscreants, do not develop devotional service to the lotus feet of Govinda. What to speak of this, they are not even qualified to remember or chant the holy names of the Lord. Okay. So it may be considered even easier to chant the holy name of the Lord than to do some other form of devotional uh, activity like that. So sometimes maybe somebody doesn't have a deity, they don't have a big temple, they don't have a way to serve the Lord in some direct fashion. But at least they can chant the holy name of the Lord. But there are some people who their hearts are so full of dis deceitful foolishness and, 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 uh, and, and evil thoughts, you know, they're miscreants, they're evildoers. 
that they cannot even chant the holy name of the Lord. And so unfortunate they are. So now uh, text 531 is in the same literature, which was Skanda Purana, right? Lord Brahma spoke the following verse. O Narada, Brahma's talking to Narada, those whose, whose practically unlimited sinful reactions have not yet been burnt to ashes cannot render devotional service to Lord Keshava, even for a moment or a fraction of a moment. So those persons who are still, they still have sins, they still have sinful reactions or karmas, right? And those have not been burnt to ashes, cannot render devotional service to Lord Keshava, even for a moment or a fraction of a moment. One has to be completely pure to perform devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Okay, so this is interesting. So by chanting the Holy Name, one becomes pure. And then he can perform the devotional service. This is the idea. Okay. So, text three, uh, five thirty-two from Yoga Vashishta. Only those who have exhausted their sinful reactions by performing austerities, cultivating knowledge, and absorbing their minds in samadhi, which is the topmost level of the eightfold Astanga Yoga system, right? over a period of hundreds of lifetimes can develop pure devotional service to Lord Krishna. So this is all the reason for stating how, how rare pure devotional service is, is to in, in, enthuse people to try to attain it, but also to explain how rare it is to glorify it, to show how, how because things which are rare are glorified, are considered great, right? If diamonds were everywhere, they wouldn't be considered to be so great, but because they're rare, right? people consider them to be very precious. So pure devotional services like that is considered to be very precious because it's rare. It's also, even if it wasn't precious, even if it wasn't rare, like in Sri Vaikuntha or Goloka Vrindavan, everybody's serving the Lord, still it's glorious. So of course, every analogy <clears throat> breaks down at a certain point. So that analogy of things being rare and being precious uh, doesn't work in the spiritual world because Pure devotional service is not rare in the spiritual world, and yet it's still as precious as it is, or even more precious than it is here. So in the Adi Varaha Purana, it's stated in text 533, a learned person who has become freed from all kinds of sinful reactions by worshipping Lord Shiva, who rides on his bull carrier, over the duration of thousands of lifetimes can become a Vaishnava. So here, this is actually saying, if we look in the Puranas, it'll say, It'll, in the Puranas, there are Suffolk Puranas, Rajaksik Puranas, Tamasic Puranas. Even in the Puranas, if you read Garuda Purana, there's a section which describes, you know, which Puranas are best, the Bhagavatam, the Vishnu Purana, the Garuda Purana. Uh, and, then, and then it'll say that there are certain Puranas which are meant for people in the mode of... Uh, all the Puranas were written by Vedavyas, okay? So some people say, well, how can you say they're all written by the same author? He's a... He's a Great spiritual master, Veda Vyasa. Why, you know, how can you say some of his literature is Tamasic and Rajasic, right? His, all his literature must be must be supreme, supremely pure. The literature of the Puranas is written for people who are in the mode of goodness, who are in the mode of passion, who are in the mode of ignorance, predominantly. No, nobody is purely in the mode of goodness or passion or ignorance, but there's a mixture of these, these modes of nature in all of us. Uh, affecting all of us, affecting all of us that are here in this material world and material bodies, because the gunas are material, the, the three modes of material nature, they're material, so they, these things cannot affect anybody who's completely spiritual or in the spiritual world. So only here in this material world, those persons who are covered by illusion. So, so, sim, so in those Puranas, sometimes it's, it recommends the worship of different devatas, not just Vishnu. In the Sattvic Puranas, it, 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 it recommends to the Sattvic people that they should worship Krishna, uh, Lord Vishnu, Lord Rama, like that, the, the Vishnu Tattva. In the, in the Rajasic and Tamasic Puranas, Shiva and Devi and other devatas are sometimes um, recommended to be worshipped. Right? So now, either this person, the person that they're talking about here in the sloka, has become a Vaishnava after thousands of lifetimes of worshipping Shiva, right? Now, the fact that he's become a Vaishnava after thousands of lifetimes means that before that, he was not a Vaishnava. He was not a Vaishnava. He was worshipping Lord Shiva, but he was not a Vaishnava. 
sorry he was a shy but he was a, a follower of Lord Shiva. So after in the, in the Puranas themselves it says it says yes it may it may recommend the worship of Shiva it may recommend the worship of of the Devi or some other demigod or some other de uh, devata, but ultimately that that worship of that devata is meant to bring us to the point of worshiping the supreme lord uh, Krishna or Sri Narayana like that. So that's the that's the point we make here. Uh, of course, now a Vaishnava can also worship Lord Shiva in the sense that Lord Shiva is a great Vaishnava also. He is a Mahajan. One of the great, one of the ten or so great personalities who are great devotees of the Lord, like that. So we shouldn't this this but this sloka this verse is not about that. It's about a person who became a Vaishnava after thousands of lifetimes of Shiva worship. That's what it's about, like that. So this is a very interesting. If we can, you know, we can point this out to people who say that they say, look in the look in the Puranas, you know. In this Purana, that Purana, it says you should worship Shiva. Shiva is supreme. Worship Shiva is supreme. And you say, sure, that's fine. That's what that Purana says for you because you're in the modes of ignorance and passion. And that's what it's recommending for you. But ultimately, this is what's meant to happen. After thousands of lifetimes of worshiping Shiva on the recommendation of some Tamasika or Jasik text or Purana, you will become a Vaishnava. You will get the mercy of the Supreme Lord and you'll become a Vaishnava. Just like Shiva, Shiva is also a Vaishnava. Okay, so sometimes people don't accept this sort of thing. Now, in India, you know, you have the followers of Lord Shiva, the followers of Devi, like that. You have different devatas, and there are people who follow them. You also have smartest who will worship any form, any any devata, any form like that, and they consider it's all the same. So they think Krishna, Narayana, Rama, Shiva, Durga, Brahma, Ganesha, it's all the same to them. So they are the followers of Adi Shankaracharya or the Advaitin or the Kaval Advaitin followers of Mayavadis, which are called Mayavadis or monists. They believe that. Then you have people who specifically worship another devata like Ganesh or like Surya or like, of uh, course, Surya is uh, understood to be Surya Narayana, but, uh, or uh, Devi or Brahma or uh, Murugan, uh, Subramanian or Shiva. So there might be people who directly worshiping Shiva. They don't want to hear about worship of anybody else like that. Uh, and then there's also smartest who worship Shiva, but worship many other devatas. Like, so these people are not exclusive Vaishnavas. They're not considered to be Vaishnavas. Vaishnava is considered to be a person who exclusively worships Vishnu Tattva, Lord Krishna, Lord Rama, you know, Srima Narayana, Narasimha, you know, any of these forms like that. So, it's important, it's important to understand the distinction between what is a Vaishnava and what's not. So sometimes you, you meet these people. So uh, for instance, the last time I was in Banaras, Banaras or Kashi or Varanasi, if you're in Varanasi, right? There are many, many uh, temples of Shiva. There's also Vishnu temples as well, but there's many, many temples of Shiva and it's known as a place which is very famous for Lord Shiva. People who, are, who die there, are. Uh, it's said that Lord Shiva personally comes and whispers uh, Rama Tarika mantra, a, a Rama mantra in their ear at the time of death, and they attain liberation and they go and serve Lord Rama in the spiritual world. So, um, you know, I was, uh, I was, I went to one, uh, my wife and I, you know, we were staying at a hotel, we went to this restaurant and, and, uh, nice vegetarian restaurant, they, they were making certain things, and the owner of the restaurant, the restaurant was called Shiva, okay. So the guy who was running the restaurant, he was actually a, um, he was very much a follower of Lord Shiva. So like that. So he sat down and started talking to us, seeing that we were wearing Vaishnava Tilak. And he started to go on about how Shiva is more important than Vishnu because, and the reason is because Rama, in, in there, there's some story about Rama in Rameshram before he went to Sri Lanka, made a Shiva Lingam and worshiped Lord Shiva in order to cross the ocean to, to, to go to Sri Lanka to get Sita back. To, to His wife was kidnapped by Ravana to get her back. So he's going on and on about this and he's saying this, this is the proof that, you know, that, that Shiva is supreme and because even Rama, who is who's an incarnation of Lord Krishna or, Krishna or Vishnu, right, was worshipping uh, Shiva like that. So I just said to him, look, 
you know, you, this is your idea. But think about it like this. Lord Vishnu comes as Vamana, and when he expands into the Trivik Rama form, and he puts his foot through the top of the, of the, of the universe, the Ganges comes down, the Ganges water flows across his feet. We are here by the side of the Ganges in Benares. The Ganges is most important in Shiva is important in Benares. The Ganges is also very important. Everybody comes there because of the Ganges, the Ganges River, the Ganga. So the Ganges flows down, it flows onto the feet of Lord Vishnu. And from the feet of Lord Vishnu, it flows down to this material world. Now, Lord Shiva took that water on his head in order to stop the world being completely washed away by the, by the torrent of the Ganges, right? That's described in many Puranas. So I said to him, who is supreme and who is not supreme? Is, is the person who is supreme the person who is getting the, 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 the water that washed the feet of the other person on his head? Or is it the person who had his feet who has his feet washed and has his foot water on the head of others. So I just said that to him like that. He couldn't reply. He couldn't answer like that. This is not a philosophical discussion. If I'm going to have a philosophical discussion with somebody, right, about something, I can quote the Vedas and I can say, Vishnu yat paramam param, Vishnu is in the supreme place, right? Vishnu is the highest, like that. I can quote so many Vedas and I can quote so many Shastras to show that the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna or Vishnu or Sri Manarayana is the Supreme God, Godhead, right? However, instead of doing that, I just gave him a very simple example, a very simple story that the Ganges flows right by your restaurant. The Ganges is most important to you. Shiva is also most important to you. But Shiva himself has the foot water of Vishnu on his head. Who is supreme and who is who is, who, is, who is the master and who is the servant in that, in that relationship, right? Who takes the foot water on their head? The servant, right? That's right. So, so this is just a leela of Lord Rama that he may worship the Shiva Lingam in order to cross the ocean. He also, he surrendered to, the, to Varuna, the, the, the god of the ocean, the god demigod, the devata of, of the ocean. He surrendered to him. And he, he, begged, he prayed to him to, to part ways to let him go to Lanka. Of course, Varuna didn't accept that surrender like that. So Rama built a bridge over the top like that. So Rama, Rama did many things like that when he, he acted like he was a human being, even Lord Krishna. When the Lord comes here, sometimes he acts, uh, you know, like a, like a human being in some ways like that. That's his leela. That's his play, right? If he's, if he's a little baby crawling around Gokula, you can't say, oh, look, he's a little baby. He can't be the Supreme Lord. It's simply a leela or a play like that. So the Supreme Personality of Godhead can come and can do those things like that. But we should understand, we should understand the relationship between the Supreme Lord, Krishna, and or Sri Narayana, and these other devatas, these other devatas like Shiva, like that. Shiva is a, Shiva is a great devotee of the Lord. He's, he's no doubt praiseworthy and worshipable by Vaishnavas also. Vaishnavas can worship him when they realize that he's a Mahajan and they should worship him only as a great devotee of the Lord and not as an equal to the Lord or superior to the Lord or as God himself, right? That's the idea. So that is the mistake that the Shaivites and the Smartas make is they equate Shiva and Vishnu or Shiva and, 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 uh, and Krishna and they don't see that Shiva is actually subordinate to Krishna, to Sri Manarayana. So this is a very good, this is a very good sloka to quote to those sort of persons like that. Although I prefer my method was much easier for the person to understand than philosophy. I just said, gave him a very simple story. And he had, he had no response for that. He couldn't possibly, you know, argue against that. There's no argument, you know. The water comes off Vishnu's feet and goes onto Shiva's head. No, no argument, finished. Okay, so text 534 uh, in uh, King Yagyadvaja, in the, that, uh, uh, the end of the story of King Yagyadvaja that's narrated in Brihad Narodi Purana, this verse appears. Only those who have accumulated piety during their previous thousands and millions of lifetimes, thousands of millions, or otherwise known in America as billions, right, 
can achieve pure devotional service to Janardana, the Lord of the Demigods. So again, it's showing how rare the pure devotional service is to the Supreme Lord, right? That, that you, somebody, only somebody who has done, you know, so you say if somebody has done some devotional service to the Lord, he must have, he must have accumulated many, many pious activities from previous lifetimes that he doesn't know about. And he's also got the grace of the Lord and been able to, to be, be able to serve the Lord today or to do pure devotional service. Text 535, in this world, bathing in the Ganges and serving guests are commonly seen, right? So people know that they should bathe in the Ganges. It's a, it's a holy river. They consider that they're washing their sins away. And serving guests, is, that's even given in the, in the, in the Vedas. It said, Atiti Dev Obala, right? The, the guest that comes to your house, even if you didn't invite him, somebody comes, comes uh, without making an appointment. They just show up like that. You have to serve the guest. And if you serve the guest, the guest is considered to be as good as God. You serve that guest. That is Indian hospitality. That is Vedic hospitality, right? According to the Vedas. Matri Devo Bhava, the mother, mother is the first guru, mother is the first teacher. So mother has to be respected like God. Pitri Devo Bhava, father has to be respected like God. Acharya Devo Bhava, the Acharya, the teacher, has to be respected as good as God. And Atiti Dev Obaba, the guest has to be respected like God. So in this world, bathing the Ganges and serving guests are commonly seen. Even the performance of various kinds of sacrifices are not difficult to witness, but pure devotional service too. So you'll see people doing sacrifices in India, all sorts of sacrifices. But pure devotional service to Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna is very, very, very extremely rare. Extremely rare. So the idea of praising it as being rare is that it's great because it's rare, like that. As I said, in, in the Lord, in the spiritual world, it's not rare, but it's still great, like that. But here in this material world, it is rare. And therefore, things in this material world which are rare are considered to be great. Um, in the words of Siloncha Vritti, which seems to be a commentary on Itihasa Samucha. Itihasa Samucha is actually a common book. It, it, uh, it contains quotes from different scriptures, which are good quotes, you know, good uh, suba, subasita, we call it. You know, these are, these are auspicious quotes like that. So, so there's apparently a commentary by some person on that called Siloncha, Siloncha Vritti. I'm not sure what that exactly means, but the, that's the name of the commentary. It says, relinquishing one's body in the Ganges, developing pure devotional service unto Lord Keshwa, and realization of the absolute truth are not the results of an insignificant penance. So it said that they, you have to, they, they, therefore, what, what it's saying is, um, it's a negative way of saying that all of these, all of these things are rare. Right, because one has to perform great penances to, to relinquish one's body in the Ganges, to, to realize the absolute truth or to develop pure dev devotional service to Lord Keshwa. In the Augustya Samhita, the Augustya Samhita once again is a, is a book by Augustya, and it's uh, very much centered on the worship of Lord Rama. But it says here, only those persons become qualified to execute pure devotional service to Lord Keshava who have been observing vows, fasting, following, follow, following scriptural rules and regulations and performing various sacrifices from their previous millions of lives. Right. So, text 3, uh, 538 to 539 from Vishnu Dhamotra, which is the, a minor Purana, says... Only one whose complete stock of sinful reactions have been eradicated can, can render pure devotional service unto Lord Keshava for a day, for half a day, or even for a moment, or for even a moment. Only after becoming completely free from all sinful reactions can one attain pure devotional service unto Lord Keshava. Uh, text 540. The Uddhava has spoken this verse to the gopis in the Shura Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Purana, 10th canto, 47th chapter, verse 24. Devotional service unto Lord Krishna is attained by charity, 
strict vows, austerities and fire sacrifices by Japa, uh, study of Vedic texts, observance of regular principles, and, and indeed by the performance of many other auspicious practices. So it's, again, difficult to attain. Now from the Bhagavad Gita, text 554, mentions from the seventh chapter, 28th verse of the Bhagavad Gita, yesham kantakatam papam jananam papakarmanam karmanam ketvan vamohane mukta basanti maam vitavitaha 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 Difficult acts. Okay, difficult uh, penances. After many, many births of ex ex executing pious activities, when one is completely freed from all contaminations and from all illusory dualities, one becomes engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. Text 542. Shukadev spoke this verse to King Prikshit, uh, as found in the Sri Bhagavatam, 5th canto, 6th chapter, 18th verse. My dear King, the Supreme Person Mukunda. Uh, is actually the maintainer of all the members of the Pandava and Yadu dynasties. He is your spiritual master, worshipable deity, friend, and director of your activities. To say nothing of this, he sometimes serves your family as a messenger or servant. This means he worked just as ordinary servants do, those engaged in getting the Lord's favor, uh, attain liberation from the Lord very easily but he does not very easily give the opportunity to render direct service unto him. So here it's saying that, that, that liberation is easy. Direct service to him or intimate service to the Supreme Lord, that's very rare and that's very difficult. In fact, so uh, it's interesting that uh, Shukadev is talking to Maharaj Preacher and he's saying that in your family, um, or, uh, the, the, the Lord, Lord Krishna, was the maintainer of all the members of the Yadu dynasty, the Pandavas, in the Pandavas. Um, and he even became their messenger. In Kantipuram, there's a temple called Pandava Dutta. So you know how we have the Yama Dutta, we have the Vishnu Dutta, and Dutta means messenger. So um, the Pandava Dutta and the, and the uh, Pandava Dutta is the is is form that Lord Krishna took when he was an uh, emissary. For the Pandavas to the, to the Kuravas, and he went and he tried to negotiate for peace so that there wouldn't be a uh, battle of Kurukshetra. So there's a huge, huge deity, sitting deity of Lord Krishna in Kanchipuram in his temple. And the idea is that, um, that Duryodhana, I guess maybe Duryodhana also, Duryodhana, especially Duryodhana the son of the, uh, the head of the hundred sons of Dhrirastra, uh, who was the head of the Kauravas, right? Who was against the Pandavas, against the five Pandavas, the five brothers who were um, on the other side, the sons of Pandu, um, the devotees of Lord Krishna. Uh, he, he wanted, he heard that Krishna was coming. So he constructed a throne uh, that was on top of, on top of a pit of, uh, of swords or spikes like that. So it was like a booby trap for Krishna. So that when Krishna would sit on the throne, and normally you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to attack a messenger. But apparently the story goes that they made this throne in such a way that if they, when they told Lord Krishna to sit on the throne, they thought that it would collapse and he would be, be impaled upon these spikes like that. So this is a very demoniac thing to do. But the fact is that Krishna came and he sat there and, and nothing happened like that. So it didn't work. The booby trap didn't work. So um, this is a temple in Kanchipuram, which, which commemorates that Leela of the Lord, that the, that the Lord went as a, as a messenger. So here in this verse, it says how that Lord Krishna went as a messenger and, and served as a messenger. A messenger is a, is a postman. A messenger is a servant, right, of the master. He takes the master's. Um, information or message from one person to another person like that. So Lord Krishna did that. He also drove the chariot. He was the chauffeur of Arjuna on the battle of Kurukshetra. He drove the chariot. He was a Parta Sarati. Sarati. Sarati means a chariot here. Of Parta. Parta means Arjuna. So this is also a service uh, situation because 
the charioteer sits down and the person in the back of the limousine or the chariot, right, sits above, you know, sits in, in, a, in a much more exalted position than the chauffeur, than the driver or the charioteer. So Arjuna was actually sitting up and Krishna was sitting down like that as the charioteer, as his servant, like that. So the Lord, the Lord, as the maintainer of these different dynasties, he actually performed service to his devotees. So how, how difficult is it? So he, he, he gives liberation very easily, but how difficult is it to get to serve him personally? Right? Even his great devotees like Arjuna, right? Krishna was serving Arjuna. So when do we see Arjuna serving Krishna? So even Arjuna couldn't get to serve Krishna. Krishna was serving him. So, so it's not so easy. Not so easy to, to get to the position of being able to serve Krishna directly. So in the Padma Purana, uh, Prahlad, King Prahlad or Maharaj Prahlad, Bhatta Prahlad, you could say, the great devotee, um, he uh, made the following prayer. Among hundreds of thousands of people, someone can hear about the science of devotional service. Among millions of those who hear about it, seldom does one follow it perfectly. So this reminds us of a, a verse in Bhagavad Gita. Manushanam sahasreshu kastid yatati siddhaye yatatam api siddhanam kastin mambeti tatpataha. Manushanam means out of, out of all men or uh, out of all human beings, all persons, right? Manusheshu, right? Sahasreshu, out of thousands, out of thousands amongst men, only one endeavors for perfection. And out of thousands who endeavor, only hardly one knows me in truth, Krishna said. So thousands of people, out of thousands and millions of people, only one of them may even want to uh, take to become a Vaishnava or, or try to serve the Lord. Like that. And out of thousands of persons who actually want to serve the Lord, right? Hardly one of them, hardly one of them gets to be able to perform personal, pure devotional service to the Lord. Text 544. It's so rare. So if someone worships the Supreme Lord while maintaining material desires, when Bhakti Devi, uh, when, then Bhakti Devi will taunt him. <laughs> so Bhakti Devi means um, devotion personified, right? Bhakti means devotion. So Bhakti Devi is the, the goddess of devotion, right? So if, if devotion herself will taunt a person, if he's, if he's maintaining material desires while he worships the Supreme Lord, because worshiping the Supreme Lord is like lighting a fire and, and, and maintaining material desires is like pouring water on the fire while you're trying to light it. If anybody ever goes camping and you get wet wood or you get uh, rain coming or something like that, it's very difficult to, to, to light a campfire or to light a fire like that because at the same time, water is coming on the fire like that. This is the same thing as maintaining material desires while we're trying to worship the Supreme Lord. Like that. It's like pouring water on a fire that you're trying to light. It's it's a it's wasting you're wasting your time. It's very so Bhakti Devi, the goddess of devotion, haunts him, laughs at him, you know, at a person who's like this. You're so foolish that you're trying you're maintaining material desires and you're thinking that you can you can uh, uh, worship the Lord while maintaining material desires. If one chants a holy name with material desires, then Bhakti Devi will just run away. The goddess of devotion will just leave you. She'll just run away. She'll just look at, oh my God, this person is trying to chant the holy name, but but keeping material desires. It's it's so uh, it's the antithesis of what we should be doing. If you want to do a process, if there's a ritual or if there's a process of devotion, something that you have to do, you should follow the rules and regulations for it. Worshiping the supreme Lord while maintaining material desires is anathema. It's exactly the opposite to what we want to do. It, it will, it will, it will, it, it's a virodi, it's, a, it's an impediment to the, to the outcome of, the, of what we're trying to do. Similarly, chanting the holy name, if we maintain material desires, it's an, it, it's an impediment to, our, to the use of the chanting of the holy names to commit simple act. We've seen it, it's an offense, commit simple activities on the strength of chanting the holy name, right? So, and if one takes shelter of the process of mystic yoga, even if one takes shelter of the process of mystic yoga, so one may think, okay, so, you know, I don't really have material desires, but let me, let, me, let me do kundalini yoga or let me do the mystic yoga, thing like that. It's a little bit 
of a divergence here from pure devotional service, right? Even though it's in the scriptures and it's a system and everything like that, but it's so indirect. It's so indirect. It's not direct pure devotional service. And therefore, the goddess of devotion, Bhakti Devi, will stay far away from such a person, right? You want to be a, you want to be a, you want to be a, you want to do puja, you want to be a worshiper like that, but you're maintaining, keeping material desires, waste of time. You want to chant the holy name, but you're maintaining material, waste, you're wasting time. You're not going to be, get pure devotion like that. But right. you all, oh, you want to, you know, you want to be a yogi, you want to be a big yogi, no, you're wasting your time. You will not, you will not get the bhakti. You will not attain pure devotional service by doing any of those things, right? So what we're talking about here is karma, jnana, and, uh, and bhakti. Actually, jnana is not really mentioned here, but, but uh, bhakti, in Chaitanya Charamita, there's also a statement like this, bhakti, mukti, siddhi, kami, sakaliya, shakta, uh, krishna, bhakti, naish, kama, ataeva, shanta, right? So the person who has no desires like that is the krishna bhakti, the devotee of krishna, and he will, he will get siddhi, he will get the perfection like that. Whereas the other people, the bhukti, the mukti in the city, these people who do mystic yoga, people who are just trying to enjoy karma, karma yoga, karma, karmas, and the jnana, you know, these people will not, will not attain. They won't be peaceful. Okay. Okay. So text four. Um, oh, considering this, who can capture devotional service? So the statement, who is saying this? Prahlad? What did it say here? Prahlad, yeah. Prahlad, Prahlad seems to be saying this. So considering these things, considering, considering, considering these things. So this, again, is a system of neti neti, not this, not this. So not by maintain, maintaining material desires when you worship, not by maintaining material desires when you chant, not by, not by maintaining, not by doing mystic yoga, not by being a yogi, would you, would you, attain, would you attain devotional service? Of course, you know, some people are attracted to these things. They're attracted to doing big sacrifices. They're attracted to doing rituals and things like that. They're attracted to maybe even check their chant, the chanting the holy name. They're attracted to kirtan and bhajan and all these things. And they're also attracted to yoga and doing these different things. So those things can be used to get people who are attracted to those things only without understanding the deeper meaning of those things, without actually performing devotional service, right? They can be attracted in that way, and that can be dovetailed into make, bringing them to the point of devotional service or pure devotional service. So that's possible. But ultimately, we have to give up um, these material desires for any of these, or even the desire to perform mystic yoga. Mystic yoga means the science whereby we're trying to uh, attain particular material cities, like the Asta cities, the eight lagima, anima, being lighter than the light, heavier than the heaven, heavier than the two places at once, like this. These are different mystic cities. So we shouldn't be interested in these things. So um, text 545, um, at the end of the story of Ritra, Ritra Sura, uh, in, in narrated in the Shema Bhagavatam 6 Canto 14th chapter, verse 2, it says, demigods situated in the mode of goodness and great saints cleansed of the dirt of material enjoyment, hardly ever render pure devotional service at the lotus feet of Lord Mukunda. Text 546. Right, so even, even great saints and people in the mode of goodness, right, even though they are cleansed of, of the dirt of material enjoyment, right, still for them, pure devotional service is rare. They hardly ever, hardly ever see them do it. So 546, let us let me offer my respectful obeisances at the feet of Bhakti Devi, devotion personified, whose glories are as lofty as Mount Mandara. It's a huge mountain. Only by her mercy has an insignificant person like me been tempted to, to understand her glories. It's very nice. Wow, is that also coming from the no? We, we should see where that's from. If, if that is also from the Bible time, we should look it up and see. I, I don't think so. Okay, it's going from somewhere else, maybe. But we can look it up. So text 547. Uh, the glories of devotional service. Now we're going to hear the glories, we're going to hear more glorification of devotional service. So 
If a devotee accidentally commits a sin, he need not undergo atonement. The word for atonement given here is payas chitantara. Uh, payas chitantara means afterwards, doing, doing atonement. Ape means sin, right? So it says here in the, uh, the Padma Purana, in a conversation between Narada Muni and King Ambarisha, which is found in the Vaishaka Mahatmyam, the glories of the month of Vaishaka, in, the, in that section of the Padma Purana, this verse appears. As a blazing fire burns dry wood to ashes, devotional service rendered to the Supreme Lord immediately burns to ashes all kinds of sinful reactions. This is a very famous verse. Um, so it's comparing um, devotional service to a forest fire. We also heard before that a chain of the Holy Names was compared to a forest fire, burning, burning of sins. So burning of sins or bur burning of sinful activity is, is, uh, is, 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 a, is, an, is an analogy here like that. We have it in, the, we have it in our rituals also where we do Soshana Dahana Plavana, where we burn and we, and we so we, we dry and we burn and we nectarize things before we offer them to the Supreme Lord, Soshana Dahana Plavana. That's also mentioned in Hari Bhakti Vilas. And also in the Buddha Shuddhi, where we consider, we think about the, we meditate upon the Papa Purusha, the sin personified in our bodies, or our bodies as being like sin personified. And then we also, through meditation and through different bija chanting of bija mantras, we burn the body to ashes and then reconstitute the body in, as a spiritual body, a nectarine spiritual body, pure body, like that, um, with other bija mantras. That is the process of Buddha Shuddhi. If anybody wants to learn about Buddha Shuddhi or how to do Soshana Dahana Plavana or purifying I think, items which we offer to the Supreme Lord in ritual um, worship, which we have covered previously, they can look at different uh, aspects of uh, the previous classes on the, in the same playlist on this YouTube channel, or they can just contact me by the, uh, the email at the end of, the, at the end of this uh, class and they can uh, you know, get in touch and and I can explain it to you. But here, pure devotional service or just devotional service in general is considered like a forest fire that burns to ashes all simple reactions from, from Papa. So, if, so what it's saying here basically it says, it says uh, Narada is saying to King Ambarish, right? This is the first of this topic, right? So if, if you commit a sin, what do you do? Well, as a Vaishnava, what do you do if you commit a sin? You can do prize to you can do atonement, you can do something to, to atone for it, right? But you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that because your devotional service itself will, will destroy the reactions that you get to a simple action like that. So Lord Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, Abhichet Sudarachiro Bhajate Mama Nanyabhat. Sadhureva. Sadhureva, if, he's a, if he is a sadhu, if he's, a, if he's rightly situated as a Vaishnava, as a holy person like that, then the, the, we shouldn't consider if, even if, it, if, if, a, if a Vaishnava gets mixed up in some horrendous, some problem, like some sinful action or something like that. Um, an example would be how, um, I think, was it uh, Vidura or somebody got it mixed up? There was it, the, the stealing of the Shamantika jewel Right there was a there was a jewel that was stolen and there was a whole intrigue and people got killed, so people got devotees of the Lord got mixed up in that, you know uh, they got mixed up in that whole scandal, so that's a, that's a sinful thing, but because they're devotees of the Lord they're not they're not uh, they're not affected by that. In uh, Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya we have the example of Pandrali Poli Alwa, who fell down with a prostitute and he. He, was, uh, he, he didn't need to atone for it, but he remembered the surrender that he did to the Supreme Lord. And that was, that's enough atonement for, for a Vaishnava like that. Of course, he was properly situated, eventually was properly situated by the Lord. Uh, so text 548, uh, in the beginning of the story of Ajamil that is uh, narrated, uh, in the Shrimad Bhagavatam, 6th Canto, 1st chapter, text 15, said, only a rare person who has adopted complete unalloyed devotional service to Krishna can uproot the weeds of sinful actions, which with no possibility that they will revive. Okay, so this is important. When we give an analogy about weeds, that sinful reactions are like weeds. There are seeds, seeds of weeds placed in our heart 
each time we do a simple action to, to, do, to again do the simple action when that, when that seed sprouts again, like that. So when it, if the analogy is when you have a garden and you weed it, but if the seeds are still there, again, the weeds are gonna grow. So, that, so that's why you have to constantly be weeding a garden because you can't, you can't get rid of every single seed. If you can get rid of every single seed of weeds, then you don't get weeds, right? So he's saying it's uh, only a rare person who has com uh, adopted complete unalloyed devotional service to Krishna can uproot the weeds of sinful actions, right? With no possibility that they will revive. Completely, properly, fully weed the, the heart and get out even the seeds for future sinful activities. He can do this simply by discharging devotional service, just as the sun can, can immediately dissipate the fog by its rays, like that. So again, here, the second part of the sloka is mentioning that, that by dis simply discharging devotional service, it's just like the sun, when the sun comes up, if there's fog, immediately the fog goes away. It's immediately dissipated, like that. The sun shines on it, and the heat of the sun just completely wipes away the fog immediately, like that. So there's two very nice analogies here, the analogy of the weeds, the sinful actions, which are like weeds and the seeds of weeds, which can be completely taken out of the garden, or weeded out of the heart, and, and the sun rising and dispelling the fog, the sun being like compared to devotional service, and the fog being like the, the fog of ignorance or maya or illusion or Simple action, simple activities, sim the reactions are simple activities. So text 549 in the, um, in the conversation between the Supreme Lord and Uddhava, which was recorded in the Shura Bhagavatam 11th Canto 14th chapter, verse 19, says, my dear Uddhava, just as a blazing fire turns wood into ashes, devotion unto me completely burned to ashes, sins committed by my devotees. Text 550, Sage Karabhanjana spoke this verse, which is found in Sri Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 5th chapter, text 42. Anyone who is fully engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord is very dear to him. And the Lord being situated in the heart of his devotee excuses all kinds of sins committed accidentally. Uh -huh. Like that, so we should look in the verse and see what the word for accidentally is. But anyway, the idea is that 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 uh, that if one performs uh, some sin accidentally, then the Lord forgives his devotee who does it. Continuing on, text five fifty one, the Supreme Lord spoke to this verse. This uh, spoke this verse to Chandra Sharma, Chandra Sharma, which is found in the Dwarka Mahatma. The Dwarka Mahatma is a glorification of the capital city of Lord Krishna, Dwarka, which is in Gujarat on the sea. Those who rendered devotional service unto me never face any difficulty, either in this world or the next. Actually, devotional service delivers millions of generations of a devotee's family to my transcendental abode. Hmm. Nice. Text 552, there is no fault if a devotee becomes attracted to material enjoyment. Now, this is interesting. This is an interesting uh, heading here, right? Because normally you would, you know, after hearing that, it sounds like, oh, we should give up all material desires. We've just been told we should give up all material desires. Now it's saying, if you're a devotee, if you have a material desire, right, there's no, there's no fault. The devotee doesn't get uh, a fault or a reaction for just simply having a material desire. So I wonder, let's see what it says, because I wonder if it's just having the material desire or acting on that material desire, which is, which is uh, being said here. So in the Shrimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 14th chapter, text 18, it says, if my devotee has not fully conquered his senses, he may be harassed by material desires. But because of his unflinching devotion to me, sense gratification will not cause him to forget me. That is a powerful statement like that. So the idea is that the Supreme Lord is saying, and we again, this comes back, this may come back also <clears throat> to what I said about Antima Shmiti, remembering the Supreme Lord at the time of death. Uh, Varaha Charma Soka says that even if you can't remember me, I will remember you. So let's say we, we died and we didn't remember the Supreme Lord. Somehow or other we didn't. Or here we, we have some 
Uh, we haven't conquered our senses completely. You know, uh, we are still harassed by material sense gratification, desires for material sense gratification, right? But because if we have unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord, sense gratification will not cause us to forget him. So even then we can remember him, remember the Supreme Lord. And by remembering the Supreme Lord, we will go to him. According to the Bhagavad Gita, Janma Kama Chame Devyam Evam Yoga Gita Pradha Chakva Deham Puna Janma Naiti Mama Jisoji The one who remembers or, or tells about my, my, my activities and my birth, like that, that person will achieve the supreme destination. Right? So, so we are able to remember the Supreme Lord even as we serve him, even if we haven't fully controlled our senses and we're harassed by material sense gratification. Desire for material sense gratification. It's a very nice, and it comes in the Bible time. <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful statement. Okay, so, so how, how great is the devotional service of the Lord, right? How great is the devotional service of the Lord that even people who have material desires, right, who haven't conquered their senses can engage in it and yet somehow or other, right, they can still remember the Supreme Lord and they're not affected by that. So even if improperly, even if we improperly perform that devotional service with material desire. Hmm. Very, very, very useful statement here. Text 553, it destroys one's attachment for karma. That is devotional service. <clears throat> Again, in the Shura Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 20th chapter, verse 9, says, one should continue to perform Vedic ritualistic activities until one actually becomes detached from material sense gratification and develops faith in hearing and chanting about me. So we can, we can, we can say that means obviously, that means logically, if one has supreme faith in hearing and chanting about the Supreme Lord, one doesn't have to worry. And, and if one is detached from material sense gratification, then one doesn't have to perform the Vedic ritualistic activities. But one should continue to perform his karmas, his Vedic ritualistic activities, until one becomes completely detached from material sense gratification and develops faith in hearing and chanting about me. Right? That, because that devotional service, right, will, uh, will um, destroy that attachment for karma. For karma. Text 554. In Shri Bhagavatam, first canto, fifth chapter, verse 17, it says, if someone gives up his occupational duties and works in Krishna consciousness and then falls down on account of not completing his work, what loss is there on his part? And what can one gain? And what can one gain if one performs his material activities perfectly? Right? So here we're talking about uh, let's continue to the next verse. Whatever has been written regarding the symptoms of an unalloyed devotee and whatever will be written later about the symptoms of, of, of surrender will reinforce the understanding that one, one engaged in devotional service becomes detached from fruitive activities. So simply engage in devotional service and you will become detached. You do not have to become detached first. You do not have to become sinless first. This is what uh, Arjuna was thinking at the Arjuna was thinking at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he was thinking, I cannot, I cannot do all this karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. I cannot do all these things, right? Because of the amount of sins that I have accumulated over this life and the previous lives, that's stopping me, that's, that's disqualification for performing any of these things that Lord Krishna is telling me to do. Like that. And Krishna says to him, finally, in the, in the 66th verse of the 18th chapter, he says, no, just abandon all varieties of, of, of dharmas, of, of self-effort. Uh, abandon all varieties of religion. Surrender unto me. Right? I will, uh, I will deliver you from the reactions of all sinful, you know, a activities. I'll, I'll deliver you from that. Forget about it. Forget about the reactions of all sinful activities in this life and the previous life. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't fear. Right? You don't have to worry that that's a disqualification. So we don't have to worry that we are sinful or that we have material desires. We can perform devotional service and gradually we'll be to become detached from fruitive activities. In the previous one here, it says here, 
if a person does his occupational duties and works in Krishna consciousness, but then falls down, has a problem like that, it's incomplete, uh, then, it, then what is the loss on his part, right? Even Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks us what happens to the yogi or the person who doesn't complete the, the, the sadhana, doesn't complete the full, the full sadhana of Kama Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, whatever it is, whatever path that he's on, he doesn't complete it. He doesn't do it perfectly. He falls down or he makes a mistake or he commits a sin. What happens to that person? That person doesn't, he, Arjuna says, does he, uh, does he perish like a riven cloud, like, a, like, like the sun shining on the cloud and dissipating the fog? Is he gone? Is all that gone for nothing? All, all, of, his, all of his works and his occupational duties, all of his devotional services are all nullified if he doesn't complete it perfectly? No. Krishna says, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. That continues. That will continue. Um, that will be accepted. That even that will be perfected. That will be completed, because he's my devotee. And what to speak of? What can one? What can one gain by if he performs material activities perfectly? His material activity. If he, by doing material activities perfectly, it doesn't. So here's the thing: if somebody says, "Well, I can do material activities perfectly, but I can't do devotional service perfectly," if you so many there's so many rules and regulations for, for pure devotional service. You don't have to do the pure devotional, devotional service perfectly. And Krishna will carry what you lack. Right? But material activities, if you're doing material activities, you have to do those perfectly. Otherwise, you cannot, you, you cannot, uh, you cannot get the result. So here it says, devotional service pleases the mind. From the first canto, second chapter, verse six, it says. Of Sri Bhagavatam, the supreme occupation of Dharma for all humanity is that by which men can attain to loving devotional service unto the transcendent Lord. Such devotional service must be unmotivated and uninterrupted to completely satisfy the self. So, in order to be completely satisfied with one's service, it should be completely uninterrupted and unmotivated. So, that's a very high bar. Still, it doesn't mean that if our service is interrupted or is motivated, we, can, we shouldn't do devotional service. We will become purified to the state. This is talking about uttama bhakti or uh, jnana kamadi and avatam, devoid of, of the desire for the results from fruit of activities and, and uh, mental speculation, etc. Right? So, savai pumsam parodamo yato bhakti rahot sujaya haitaki apati yata. A haitaki apati, the third verse. The third line is, is very important, unmotivated and uninterrupted. Ahaitaki apratiyata. Yayatma supersiviti. Like that. It's a very important verse in the Bible. Text 557, coming from the 11th canto, 14th chapter, verse 22 of the Shrimad Bhagavatam. Truthfulness, compassion, religious principles, austerity, and knowledge cannot purify the hearts of those who are not engaged in my devotional service. So the key here is. Engage in devotional service, everything that you lack will be supplied by the Lord. Whereas you may have, you may have all these other qualities, truthfulness, compassion, religious principle, austerity, knowledge. You may have of the scriptures, whatever. You may have all of these in abundance, but if you're not engaged in devotional service to the Lord, it's a waste of time because it can't purify your heart. The key is devotional service. That's the point. Uh, 558. It's simply, it's supremely purifying devotional service. So in Shrimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 14th chapter, verse 21, it's stated, undivided devotional service, like focused, undivided devotional service can purify even those born in the families of dog eaters. Right? So it's not dependent on caste. It is the supreme occupation. So text 559 from Shrimad Bhagavatam, 6th canto, 3rd chapter, verse 22. Therefore, persons whose minds are fixed on the Lord engage in the intensive practice of devotional service. That is the only means of attainment of final perfection of life. It's a supreme occupation. It's stated, text 560 in the Poma Purana. Uh, there's no need to study many literatures to chant varieties of mantras, or to perform thousands of Vajrapaya Vedic sacrifices. We described Vajrapaya as a very big Vedic sacrifice before. For those 
who have developed firm faith in the devotional service of Lord Janardana. Text 561. It awards one all good qualities. In the fifth canto, 18th chapter, 12th verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj has spoken this verse. One who has unflinching devotion for the personality of God and has all the good qualities of demigods. But one who is not a devotee of the Lord has only, has only material qualifications that are of little value, right? So devotee, good. Non-devotee, not good, right? Dep so this is a very, very, very black and white statement here, that you may have all these really good qualities, but if you're not a devotee of the Lord, if you're not surrendered to the Lord, if you're not a proper a refugee at the feet of the Lord, uh, you know, you, are, you have no good qualities. He considered to have no good qualities. This is because he is hovering on the mental plane and is certain, is, is certain to be attracted by the glowing material energy. So no matter how good your material qualifications are, they're going to keep you here in this material world. Whereas no matter how meager your spiritual qualifications are, if you simply have faith in the Lord and surrender to the Lord and his devotee, he will, take, he will supply what you, you, you lack and he will take you to a supreme destination which is eternal service at his lotus feet in the supreme world. So devotional service also uproots the false ego. Uh, Manu has spoken this verse to Dhruva in the Shumar Bible, time, fourth canto, 11th chapter, verse 30. Thus, regaining your natural position <clears throat> and rendering service unto the supreme Lord, who is the all-powerful reservoir of all pleasure, who lives in all living entities as super soul, you will very soon forget the illusory understanding of I and mine. Text 563. The sages headed by Sanaka uh, spoke this verse to King Pritu in the Srimad Bhagavatam 4th Canto, 22nd chapter, verse 39. The devotees who are always engaged in the service of the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord can very easily overcome hard-knotted desires for fruitive activities. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, the jnanis and yogis, uh, although trying to stop the waves of sense gratification, cannot do so. Therefore, you're advised to engage in the devotional service of the Lord, of Lord Krishna, of Krishna, the son of Vasudeva. So it's easy, easy for devotees, but difficult for uh, karmis and jnanis and yogis. Okay, so... It is the best of all paths, devotional service to the Lord. Lord Kapila spoke this verse in Shrimad Bhagavatam, third canto, 25th chapter, verse 19. Performance in self, uh, perfection in self-realization cannot be attained by any kind of yogi unless he engages in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for that is the only auspicious path. Yeah. Text 565. In the sixth canto, first chapter, verse 17 of Srimad Bhagavatam, it says, the path followed by pure devotees who are well-behaved and fully endowed with the best qualifications is certainly the most auspicious path in this material world. It is free from fear and is authorized by the Shastras. Text 556 and 557. Therefore, Sukadev spoke these verses, which are found in the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, second chapter, verses 34, 33 and 34. For those who are wandering the material universe, there's no more auspicious means of deliverance than what is aimed at in the direct devotional service of Lord Krishna. The great personality Brahma, with great attention and concentration of mind, studied the Vedas three times, right? Not just once, three times. And after examining them very carefully, he has ascertained that attraction for the Supreme Personality of God in Sri Krishna is the highest perfection of religion. Text 568, through devotional service awards all objectives of life. In the, uh, Narada makes this statement in Vriya Narada Purana. Just as water sustains all living entities, devotional service is certain to cause all types of perfection. That is to say, nothing substantial can be accomplished without the engagement in the devotional service of the Lord. Whatever you do, which is not associated with the devotional service of the Lord, is insubstantial is in, insignificant, whereas water, 
just like water, which sustains the living being. Devotional service, right, is certainly the cause of all types of perfection. Without water, you can't live. Because if you have water, you can live and, and you can prosper. Okay. So, text 569. Just as a living being is protected by the mother as she sustains him within her womb, it is by the mercy of Bhakti Devi, the goddess of devotion, that uh, goddess of devotion personified, that one achieves perfection in devotional service. Text 570. The statements of the Vishnu Dutas are found in the Vajaropana Mahatma. Vajaropana. Vajra Ropana means Vajra Aropana means uh, flag raising. The Mahatma, the glories of raising the flag. Usually we raise a flag in a temple. The temple flag is raised with Kuruda on it in the Vishnu temples. With uh, Nandi, the, the bull carrier on, uh, or, the, or the lion in Shiva and Durga temples. But in the Vajra Ropada is the, is the glories of raising the flag at the beginning of a festival. We bring the flag down at the end of the festival to <coughs> two rituals that are performed in, in, in temple worship. So anyway, there's some statements by the Vishnu Dutas, the messengers of Lord Vishnu. Simply by remaining solidly engaged in devotional service under the Supreme Lord, even the most simple person can attain the supreme destination. Text 571. In a conversation between Yamaraj and a Brahmana that is recorded in the Vaishaka Mahatmyam, the glories of the month of Vaishak in the Padma Purana, it is stated, for a devotee of Lord Hari, nothing is difficult to obtain, such as children, wealth, a wife, pearl necklace, house, vehicle, kingdom, residence in heaven, or even liberation. Simply by his will, a devotee can achieve these things. Right. If you're a devotee, you can easily achieve these things. It's Important in major. Text 52. In the first canto, second chapter, verse 7, Shrima Bhagavatam, it says, by rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Text 573 to 574. In the conversation between the Supreme Lord and Uddhava that is found in the Sri Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 20th chapter, verses 32 to 33, it says, everything that can be achieved by fruitive activities, penance, knowledge, attachment, mystic yoga, charity, religious duties, and all other means of perfecting life is easily achieved by my devotees through loving service unto me. If somehow or other my devotee desires promotion to heaven, Liberation or a residence in my abode, he, achieve, he easily achieves such benedictions. Text 575. Therefore, in the Sri Bhagavatam, second canto, third chapter, verse 10, it is stated whether one is without desire, the condition of the devotees, uh, or is desirous of all fruitive activities, or is after liberation, right? These are all different types of persons. One should, with all efforts, try to worship the Supreme Personality of God for complete perfection, culminating in Krishna consciousness. So this is a very, very famous verse in Akama Sarvakama Va, Moksha Kama Udara Dihi, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, Yajeta Pusham Param. Very, very important uh, verse in Shah Bhagavatam. Right. So whether you have no desires, or you have desires for all sorts of fruitive activities, or even if you desire liberation or, or moksha like that, you should, or everybody should perform the worship of the Supreme Personality of God and engage in devotional service. Okay. Text 576, devotional service is superior to liberation. So Lord Kapila spoke this verse, which is combined from two verses found in Sri Bhagavatam. That is, uh, Third Canto, 25th chapter, verses 32 and 33. Yeah. So when the, when the service spirit is in, when the service spirit is engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead without any motive, that is far better even than salvation. Bhakti devotional service dissolves the subtle body of the living entity without separate effort, just as fire in the stomach dissolves what all that we eat. Okay, so it's saying that 
bhakti or devotional service to the Lord is like a fire which destroys the which destroys or dissolves the subtle body or the false ego of the living being, his senses, dulls the senses, so he's not interested in sense gratification. Just as the same way as the fire of digestion, Vaishvanaya fire in the stomach, to digest all the things that we eat. Text 577. At the end of the description of Lord Rishabh Dave, this verse appears in Sriman Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 6th chapter, verse 17. Devotees always bathe themselves in devotional service to get rid, to get relief from the tribulations of material existence. By doing this, the devotees enjoy supreme happiness and liberation personified comes to serve them. Nevertheless, they do not accept that service from liberation personified, even if it is personally offered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For the devotees, liberation is very unimportant because having attained the Lord's transcendental loving service, they have obtained everything desirable and have transcended all material desires. So for a devotee, for a Vaishnava, and this is true for all Vaishnava sects, all Vaishnava sampradayas, the, the, the devotional service of the Lord is liberation. That is their liberation. That is their concept of liberation, is eternal service. They, there's nothing like this idea that they're in the Semitic religions or the Abrahamic religions that we go to heaven and we just enjoy in the heaven. No. We go to heaven to serve. We go to heaven to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And if we stay here in this material world, we serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In each and every position, the Vaishnava is interested in service because service, service to the Lord is the innate nature of, of the individual, of the soul. The soul is eternally a servant of the Lord. Jiva Surya Poi, Nitya Krishna Das. Eternally, Krishna Das, a servant of the Supreme Lord. Like that. So it's understood that that is, that is the most fundamental basic um, uh, aspect or qualification or quality of the soul is service of the Lord. We are servers and we are meant to serve. That's, uh, that's our most basic uh, qual uh, nature. So text 578, Lord Shiva spoke this verse to Markandeya, which is found in Srimad Bhagavatam 12th canto, 10th chapter, verse 6. Surely this saintly Brahmana does not desire any benediction, nor even liberation itself, for he has attained pure devotional service unto the inexhaustible personality of Godhead. Right. So Shiva understands that this, he's talking about some Brahman. He's saying, hey, if this person is engaged in uh, devotional service to the Lord, he must not want any other benediction. He must not even want liberation itself. Text 579, Sukadeva Goswami spoke this verse, which is found in Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 14th chapter, text 43. My dear king, the activities of Bharat, Bharat Maharaj are wonderful. He gave up his kingdom, his wife, and his family, which would, be, which would have been very difficult for others to renounce. His opulence was so great that even the demigods envied it, yet he gave it up. It was quite befitting for a great personality like him to be an exalted devotee. He could renounce all of this because he was att attracted to the beauty, opulence, reputation, knowledge, strength, and renunciation, right? Which are all the, the qualities, unlimited uh, auspicious qualities of the Supreme Lord, of the Supreme Personality of God in Krishna. Krishna is so attractive that one can give up all desirable things for his sake. So when we, if we desire something, if there's something greater that we desire, we give up the lesser desire. A person who's starving will eat uh, stale bread and water. But if he sees something better to eat, he's not going, he's going to give up the stale bread and water. The material desires and material, uh, material activities in this material world are like stale bread and water. The devotional service to the Lord is like a feast. It's like a feast of nectar. So indeed, even liberation is considered insignificant for those whose minds are attracted to the loving service of the Lord. And again, text 580, you know, the Supreme Lord spoke this verse in the Shrub Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 14th chapter, in the 14th verse. The devotee who has offered his very life to me does not want anything separate from me, not the position of a demigod within the universe, even Brahma or Indra, nor lordship over an entire planet, or even the lower planetary systems, nor the mystic perfections of yoga, nor even liberation from the cycle of repeated birth and death. Very, very clear. 
text five, uh, 581, Lord Shiva makes the following statement in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, 6th Canto, 17th chapter, verse 31. Those who are firmly fixed in the devotional service of Lord Vasudeva, Krishna, and thus are engaged with no, endowed with knowledge and detachment, never accept anything other than devotional service. Prahlad in Texas 582. Prahlad offers this prayer, which is found in the Vishnu Purana. So the story of Prahlad is also there in the Vishnu Purana. What is the use of religiosity, economic development, or sense gratification? What, what we call is Dharma and uh, Dharma, Arta and uh, Tama, right? For one who has developed devotion unto unto your lotus feet, the eternal shelter of all universes. Indeed, even liberation, moksha, is always within his grasp. Text 583. Therefore, in the Narasimha Purana, it's stated, without money, anyone can collect leaves, flowers, fruit, and water. If by the strength of devotional service one can obtain the, the uh, if by the strength of devotional service one can obtain the favor of the Supreme Lord, why should he endeavor for liberation? Text 584. In Sri Bhagavatam, first canto, seventh chapter, verse 10, it's stated, all varieties of Atmaramas, those who take pleasure in the self, especially those established in the path of self-realization, though freed of all kinds of material bondage, desire to render unalloyed pure, devo pure devotional service unto the personality of Godhead. This means that the Lord possesses transcendental qualities and therefore can attract any, everyone, including liberated souls. Right? The Kumaras are the example of this. The, the four Kumaras, they were liberated souls. Uh, they were completely self-realized, but, but they, even they were attracted to serving the Lord. They smelled the tulsi leaves that, were, that are placed on the, on, the, on the articles which are offered to the Lord on the lotus, lotus feet. And just by smelling those tulsi leaves, the fragrance of that, they were attracted to serving the Supreme Personality of God and Lord Krishna. So text 585. Uh, it delivers one to the abode of Vaikuntha, devotional service. So from Vamana Purana, it says, those who have unflinching faith in the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, who carries the chakra and club in his hands, will attain his eternal abode on the strength of their devotional service. Text 586 in the Skanda Purana, it stated, if one is firmly fixed in the devotional service of the Supreme Lord, having fully controlled his mind and senses while constantly chanting the holy names of the Lord, whether he's a sage, right, or a saint or a sannyasi or whatever, or a householder, the hustle, he will be elevated to the supreme abode of Lord Vishnu. Text 587. Uh, in a description of the glories of Vaikuntha, the supreme Lord's abode, this is found in the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, 15th chapter, verse 25. Persons whose bodily features change in, uh, change in ecstasy, right, their hair stands on end, they... You know, who breathe heavily and perspire due to hearing the glories of the Lord, they're in ecstasy, right? are promoted to the kingdom of God, even though they do not care for meditation and other austerities, right? So somebody may be sitting alone, meditating, doing something like that. It's very difficult. But once you hear, if you just simply hear about the glories of the Lord and his pastimes like that, you can get the ecstasies that are, in, uh, are very difficult to achieve for a yogi who's sitting and meditating by himself. The kingdom of God is above the, mat the material universes. And it is desired by Brahma and other demigods, right? So, text 5588. This prayer of Lord Brahma in, is found in Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 14th chapter, verse 5. O Almighty Lord, in the past, many yogis achieved the platform of devotional service by offering everything to you and faithfully carrying out their prescribed duties. Through such devotional service, perfected by the process of hearing and chanting about you, they come, they came to understand you and could thus easily surrender to you and achieve your supreme abode. Text 589. Pure devotional service pleases the Supreme Lord. So not only do you take you to Vaikuntha, but it pleases the Supreme Lord. In response to the question of how to please the Supreme Lord, this is important. That is found in Priyadnaradiya Purana, this verse appears. So how do we please the Supreme Lord, right? Lord Hari, who, remo who removes the distresses of the surrendered soul, right? Hari means one who takes away. So he takes away the distress of the surrendered soul. 
who is affectionate to his devotees and who is the master of the demigods, is pleased only by devotional service and no other process. Text 590 to 591. He, while instructing his classmates at school in the Gurukula, Prahlad spoke these verses, which are found in the seventh canto, seventh chapter, verses 51 and 52 of Shrimad Bhagavatam. My dear friends, O sons of demons, you cannot please the Supreme Personality of God in simply by becoming perfect Brahmanas, demigods, or great saints, or by becoming perfectly good in etiquette or vast learning. None of these qualifications can awaken the pleasure of the Lord, nor by austerity, charity, sacrifice, cleanliness, or vows can one satisfy the Lord. The Lord is pleased only if one has unflinching, unalloyed, pure devotion to him. Without sincere devotional service, everything is simply a show. Ah, as it is, the Lord is really giving them as it is. Text 592. This prayer to Lord Nusimhadev is found in Shrimad Bhagavatam, 7th canto, 9th chapter, verse 9. One may possess wealth, an aristocratic family, beauty, austerity, education, sensory expertise, luster, influence, physical strength, diligence, intelligence, and mystic yoga power. But I think that even by all these qualifications, one cannot satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. However, one can satisfy the Lord simply by devotional service. The Gendra did this, right? And thus, the Lord was satisfied with him. In the story in the Bhagavatam of the Gajendra Moksha, where Gajendra was off of liberation, it was, he was dying, and he thought, with my last dying breath, let me pluck, pluck a lotus flower and offer it to the Supreme Person. as devotional service. Text 593. Elsewhere it's stated, What did the hunter do? What was Dhruva's age? How learned was Gajendra? Was Kubja beautiful? Did Sudama have any wealth? Did Vidura have a family? Was Ugrasena, the king of the Yadavas, very powerful? The fact is, Lord Madhava becomes pleased only by devotional service and not by mere activities, age, or knowledge. So all of these, all, all of these examples, the hunter, Dhruva, the Jendra, Kubja, Sudama, Vidura, Ugrasena, they all had less. Uh, you know, Dhruva was young, the Jendra was an, an animal, Kubja wasn't beautiful. Sudama didn't have any wealth. He was poor. Vidura didn't have a family. Ugrashena wasn't a powerful king like that. Um, exactly the hunter, I don't know. But, um, uh, but, uh, but still, by performing devotional service, they, they pleased the Supreme Personality of God. Text 594. Therefore, the Supreme Lord has stated in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 26, Patram, Pushpam, Palam, Toyam, these four things, leaf, flower, Fruit, water, your may bhakti prayachiti, offer to me with love and devotion, right? I will accept it, right? Tadaham bhakti upahrityam ashtami prayatatmanaha, right? It's a very, very famous verse, right? If, if anyone offers to me with love and devotion a fruit, a, a flower, a leaf, some fruit or water, I accept it. Simple as that. It's not the fruit, the flower, the leaf, the water, which is important in this verse. What's important is the bhakti. Twice bhakti is mentioned here. The devotion, love and devotion to the Lord, which is important. That's what the Lord wants. Text 595. In the uh, statement of Hanuman is recorded in Shrava Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 19th chapter, verse 7. One cannot establish a friendship with the, with the Supreme Lord Ramachandra on the basis of material qualities such as one's birth in an aristocratic family, personal beauty, eloquence, sharp intelligence, or superior race or nation. None of these qualifications are a prerequisite for friendship with Lord Sri Ramachandra. Otherwise, how is it possible that although we uncivilized inhabitants of the forest are not of noble birth, have no physical beauty, and, are, and cannot speak like gentlemen, Lord Ramachandra has accepted us as friends? Right, Hanuman, the monkeys, the varnas, the subhumans, like that. They were accepted as the friends by Lord Ramachandra. Text 596. Uh, again, we're talking about uh, pure devotional service or devotional service. It awards one's the Lord's association. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 11, verse 54, it's stated, 
My dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. Text 597. Uh, in a conversation between the Supreme Lord and Uddhava that appears in the Shrima Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 14th chapter, verse 25, it's said, just as gold when smelted in fire gives up its impurities and returns to its br pure brilliant state. Similarly, the spirit soul absorbed in the fire of bhakti yoga is purified of all contamination caused by previous fruitive activities and returns to its original position of serving me in the spiritual world. Text 598. Uh, it's also said in the Bhagavatam, uh, in the 11th canto, 18th chapter, verse 45, my dear Uddhava, I am the supreme lord of all worlds, and I create and destroy this universe, being its ultimate cause. I am thus the supreme, the absolute truth, and one who worships me with unfailing devotional service comes to me. Uh, text 599, the devotional service even controls the supreme lord. In a conversation between Narada and Shonaka, uh, that is found in uh, Kartik Mahatma, the glories of the month of Kartik in section in the Padma Purana, this verse appears. If Lord Hari is worshipped, he easily awards ma one material enjoyment and even liberation, but he does not easily give loving devotional service because such devotional service places him under the control of the devotee. Text 600. In a conversation between Narada and King Ambarish, which is found in the Vaishak Mahatma, the glories of the month of Vaishak, in the Padma Purana, it's stated, the Supreme Lord is the controller of Maya or illusion, and so he is never overwhelmed by such illusion. And yet, saintly, saintly devotees can bring the Supreme Lord under their control by pure devotional service. Text 601 to 602. In the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam in the 11th canto, 14th chapter, Verses 20 to 21, the Lord says, My dear Uddhava, the unalloyed devotional service rendered by my devotees brings me under their control. I cannot be controlled by those engaged in mystic yoga, Sankhya philosophy, highest work, right, which is karma yoga, right, um, Vedic study, which is jnana yoga, austerity, or renunciation. Only by practicing unalloyed devotional service with full faith in me can one obtain me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Om Namo Narayanaya Om Namo